My guest today is John Azariah. John, how are you? Good to meet you. What's, uh, what do you do, John? Um, I'm the lead for the Q Sharp language at uh, Microsoft uh, at the quantum team. Okay. Yeah, Q Sharp language. That's a new language, right? Yes, it is. It's, what is it? It's a domain specific language for expressing quantum computation for the quam quantum computer that we're building. I have a confession to make. Yes. I don't know anything about quantum computing. Um, so, um, strangely enough, I'm probably the only language designer in the world that has written a language that I'm not qualified to program in. What? <laughs> we'll just see about that. <laughs> so, it turns out that um, uh, quantum computing is a pretty aggressive and pretty uh, advancing field. Yes. And uh, the state of the art uh, is actually people drawing out circuits and reasoning about them, mostly in, in, in the form of mathematics. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, programming as such has been something that I've been doing for a few decades now. Uh, and uh, it, it turns out that uh, expressing quantum computation as a program is strictly more expressive than drawing it out as a circuit. And uh, I've had like some experience uh, with designing domain-specific languages and so on. Mm -hmm. And the team that's run by my boss and Microsoft, um, I think together we have several decades worth of language design experience behind us. And we basically formulated uh, a fairly strong case to come up with a speci special language to express quantum computer computations in. And uh, so I know enough about the domain of quantum computing to okay. know what a quantum program should look like. But the actual programs themselves tend to be written by people with uh, a, a solid background in quantum computing. Uh, most of the people on our floor have at least one PhD in mm. that regard and uh, have worked in this field, uh, pioneers in this field in many ways. So, so what is quantum computing? So quantum computing is a very interesting uh, phenomenon. Um, I'll rephrase that. Um, so quantum computing is when you can use naturally occurring quantum mechanical phenomena that take place in nature and uh, sort of uh, massage them and use them for our profit by taking advantage of, of uh, these phenomena to actually do computing with. So I'll give you an example. Yes. Um, so back in the 1950s, uh, you know, people like Richard Feynman were trying to uh, solve um, the structure of, of um, molecules by looking at how the electrons in the atoms would interact with each other. Okay. Okay. Now, if you start with hydrogen, which is a very simple molecule, yep. um, you can kind of work that out as a, and I have a degree in chemistry. I have back, a degree in biochemistry. Yes, from back in the day. Um, you could work out so ground state energies and stuff like that, electronic uh, interaction okay. energies, uh, as a sort of third year project. You could, you could, I mean, that's a computation that you can draw out um, with a third year um, science degree. Okay. Uh, differential equations and so on. You can solve that problem. That's peak uh, Yeah. But, but the moment you start getting into um, more complex molecules, the number of electrons that interfere with each other and the way in which they actually form the molecule, the structure of the molecule and so on, that's dictated by the quantum mechanical phenomena that take place inside the, the molecule. Okay. And to compute the, those structures is mathematically very hard. Hmm. Um, and so far, so hard, in fact, that uh, several molecules that we're very familiar with, like chlorophyll, for example, they're intractable to com uh, to compute classically. You mm -hmm. just can't do it. You can't. Uh, they're bigger than the biggest computers in the world. Uh, in fact, the memory that you need to represent the problem uh, requires more complex numbers than there are atoms on the planet. Okay. So. We are now talking strictly in the realm of really difficult problems that cannot be solved easily from a classical standpoint. Okay. Now, uh, Feynman had this uh, insight that said, hey, there's this hard problem to represent what's going on inside this molecule, right? Why can't we twist it around and use the molecule as effectively something that computes a hard problem? So if we can represent the problem in a way that the molecule can actually represent something, 
then we could effectively use a quantum phenomenon actually as a computing device. And that sort of tw turned the problem on its head. Huh, okay. And now we have the, the ability to formulate systems. Um, and this is not new. This has been going on for some time with varying degrees of efficiency and varying degrees of, of, uh, of uh, accuracy and so on. Um, where you can build a two-state quantum system that is in two states and take advantage of quantum phenomena and be able to represent your problem in that in terms of the quantum phenomenon hmm. and let the quantum device do the computing for you okay. and uh, we've done that with varying degrees of, uh, of size not very big problems but the goal is someday we will actually be able to build uh, a quantum bit a qubit in a way that allows us to scale up and build thousands of these qubits together so that we can solve problems that you literally cannot solve. So a qubit, is that a, a processor, like a CPU? So a qubit's an interesting device. It's a quantum, um, it's, a, it, um, it's a system, right? It can be an ion, it can be a, a single atom, hmm. it can be a photon that's polarized in a particular way. Hmm. There are many, many, quantum systems that are available in the physical world okay. that effectively store state okay. and can be operated upon using um, linear algebra type uh, primitives. Hmm. So you can basically um, use the, the two level system as a way to store state and compute. Hmm. So different manufacturers and different approaches take different uh, um, you know, they make different qubits. They make qubits in different ways. Okay. So, uh, but how does that differ from just storing state on a regular processor or a regular storage device? That's a brilliant question. So, uh, traditionally, you can create a JK flip flop by using a bunch of transistors. Yep. And that will hold state, right? Right. Now, uh, what state you can hold is typically one of two voltages, zero or one. Right. Right. And you'll end up having this binary system that you can now uh, build computation on. Mm -hmm. So if you have 64 bits, then 64 bits, then we can figure out how to do addition with them. Mm -hmm. We can figure out how to do exponentiation, so on and so yep. forth. Um, and then we have classical computing, mm -hmm. right? A qubit is a two-level system, but if you actually think about it, it's not so much um, a set that, uh, uh, something that holds a single value. Uh, well, it does hold a single value, but it's, it's uh, a single value in a space that is actually um, infinite in size. So it's not just zero or one mm -hmm. to the discrete values, but any linear combination of something that represents zero and one. Oh, so we could store a lot more data in a smaller space. Is that the advantage? Well, you store one point. One point, still. okay. You still store one value. Oh. But that value can be from a much larger universe. Oh, okay, all right. Right? So if you think about this, uh, I wish I had a, there's a football over there. I could have brought that in. That would have been a perfect uh, a prop for this. Okay. But if you think about a, a sphere, uh -huh. um, say a big beach ball, yep. and you have a north pole on the beach ball and a south pole on the beach ball, a two-level binary system would effectively be, hey, is the dot on the zero or on the one? Okay. That's a transistor. Yeah. A quantum system allows you to put the dot anywhere on the surface of okay. the sphere. So now there are an infinite number of points on the surface of the sphere, and you can get to those points by basically taking this, the beach ball and rotating it around in particular ways. So those kinds of operations can be performed on this, okay. the, the beach ball to move points around, hmm. right? To move where you, are, where you are on the beach ball. Right. And that system allows you to compute with a degree of parallelism because of the way in which the beach balls combine, um, much more than you can with individual bits that are either. Oh, okay, about. so we build much so, more complex systems indeed. using yeah. this, this. You get uh, a degree of natural parallelism. Of state, possible states. I beg your pardon. You get a degree of mat natural parallelism that comes from this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, if, as I understand, we have not built this yet. There, are, there are no quantum computers. So built today. Is that true? The state of the art is that there are qubits have actually been built and observed. Okay. Okay, single qubits. Single qubits. Uh, so a quantum system would be a collection of qubits. Yes. Okay. So single qubits have been built and observed. Uh, I think you can 
uh, you can observe single photons, uh, single photonic qubits, and so on and so forth. There are different systems that actually do this. Each of them have different characteristics. What Microsoft has uh, is a goal to build a qubit that will last a long time, okay. so that it will survive a series of operations on it hmm. without losing its value or decohering. Oh. Hmm. Now this is. Uh, um, I'm old enough to remember this. I don't know if you are, but uh, we used to have magnetic. Fifty-six. Uh, <laughs> we used to have audio tapes. Yeah. Now, if you take an audio tape and you wave it around in a magnetic field, that's bad. Um, you kind of, lo you know, the, the the sound gets fuzzy. Right. <laughs> right. What's actually happening is, inside the, the the magnetic tape, you have atoms that have been magnetized in a particular direction. Right. And now you've introduced confusion into the right. into Some of the, the zeros become ones, ones and vice and then they, versa. they move around a little bit, and then you'll end up having... That's how grunge rock was born. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, but effectively, what happens is you lose information, and everything moves towards a state, state of chaos. Ah, okay. So qubits decohere as well hmm. for a variety of reasons, in, you know, mostly involving interference with the environment around them and so on and so forth. So there's a, there's a time called the decoherence time, which is a hard limit on how long something will actually hold on to information ah, okay. well enough for you to do something. And since operations take time to actually do, you need to have uh, uh, the qubit hold its state long enough for you to actually... And that's the challenge we're facing right now for building these things. Indeed. Is, and uh, that is actually an enormous challenge. So you have plenty of people in the market who built transmog qubits which don't last very long, mm -hmm. but they, pr they exhibit the qubited behavior. Um, we are shooting for a much higher goal at Microsoft. We are looking to get what is known as a topologically protected qubit. That's kind of the, I got the, your the, quantum, the, the uh, infinity Mobius on strip. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and and this kind of a, a, a device is has the protection towards uh, immunity towards noise built into the actual system hmm. in a way that actually uh, allows it to hold on to its state for uh, several orders of magnitude to more time than others. At least that's the goal that we're shooting for. I see. Yep. Okay. Well, this is this is a good start. Yeah. I feel like I now know everything about quantum computing. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> well, no, the, the I don't. I, I know more than I did 20 <laughs> minutes ago, but that's... Uh, <laughs> so the, the principles of quantum computing are fairly straightforward. Okay. Um, the application of how to encode your problem into the system so that you get a quantum speed up, that's where the magic is. And mm. that is a conversation that will probably take several years. And the, problem, the conversation won't be with me. It'll be somebody who actually knows how to do that. Because encoding uh, algorithms um, into uh, the quantum computing and quantum information systems and allowing them to use the quantum phenomena to get the speed ups that you need that is indeed the magic of quantum computing. Okay. And that's in fact the reason why the programs that are really written in Q Sharp are written by people who can do that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. So programming in Q Sharp programming in Q Sharp or programming any language against a quantum computer will not be a trivial thing. It will be uh, it will be hard. Is that fair Look, to say? Um, it's a lot more accessible than than uh, trying to uh, express something in a way that cannot be computed at all. It's just uh, you know, something that you write down and reason over, for example, okay. right? All right. Uh, however, and and this stuff is 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 this stuff requires some learning, but you know it's not insurmountable learning. Okay. Either. All right. Fair enough. So it's just that there's uh, we now have a platform that allows people to learn quantum computing in terms of a language. So okay. you have something that a graduate student or an undergraduate student can actually pick up the concept from a programming perspective right from the get-go and actually become a quantum programmer at the end of it. End of the right, so right now they can download the language and start playing with it uh, oh, yeah. against some sort of emulator that, uh, yeah, we look, have that looks like a quantum computer to the, to the language. That's right. I mean, we have a quantum computer simulator that we've open source. I mean, the, the simulator itself is not open source, but the product is freely available. I see. And then the libraries that allow you to operate on top of that um, those are open sourced mm -hmm. and they're available on GitHub. And then the, the language and the tools are freely available from the quantum development kit that you can download from Microsoft.com. And uh, yeah, you can actually start building your little algorithms. Um, 
I mean, look, uh, the, we have 20 perfect qubits that we can simulate on your laptop. Hmm. Um, okay. We can push to 30 perfect qubits uh, on a really good machine with uh, 16 or 32 terabytes, I mean, of RAM, uh, 60 hmm. to 30 gigabytes of RAM. And if you want to go even further, then you can actually push into the Azure cloud and, uh, and run a much bigger simulation. I see. But uh, we're waiting for the time when we have hundreds and, and uh, hundreds of qubits, which will represent numbers that we cannot actually classically simulate. Oh, when will that happen? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, Microsoft's announced that we will shoot to get one qubit by the end of this year. Okay. And a commercially viable quantum computer in the end of, by the end of five years. That's that's the stated okay. goal. Okay. That's what we're working very hard towards. Um, but whether that is going to be hundreds or thousands of qubits, um, we we haven't specified that right. yet. No. Where would people go to learn more about quantum computing and Q Sharp? So you'd start by going to Microsoft.com/quantum. Mm -hmm. um, that'll give you. Uh, the place where you can bounce off and get the quantum development kit. We have introduced uh, pretty robust tool tooling for Visual Studio um, and Visual Studio Code. So we have code coloring and all of that stuff happening in Visual Studio Code. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely cross-platform thing. You can run the simulator on a Mac. Mm -hmm. You can do development on this on a on Linux box. Very nice. And uh, that's like available right now. You can go off and get it from there. If you go to Microsoft.com, uh, docs.microsoft.com slash quantum, you'll get all of the documentation associated with it. Mm -hmm. And if you go to github.com slash Microsoft slash quantum, that's the quantum uh, set of repositories under Microsoft's GitHub uh, umbrella. Uh, you'll get the open source library. Um, you'll get access to all of that. And we actively accept pull requests. So, you know, if you... Um, if you have a better way of explaining something or a more powerful algorithm for something, okay. we will happily uh, accept pull requests on that. Excellent. Well, I do feel like I know a lot more than I did just a few minutes ago. So, John, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Here I am with NDC Oslo, um, where we're a big conference, meeting a lot of friends, learning about a lot of technology, having a great time. You should come to this conference too. <laughs>